For a full 12 months a year, the 28 teams of the National Football League prepare for one day in January, Super Bowl Sunday. Every phase of every team's operation is focused on a single goal, the World Championship of Professional Football. Over 1,200 men have America's microscope can follow a player for the rest of his life. The stakes are high and the rewards are great. The team is awarded the Vince Lombardi Trophy, named in honor of the man who won the first two Super Bowls. More than 500 million people world first two Super Bowls. More than 500 million people worldwide watch the Super Bowl, waiting for someone to emerge as a folk hero. <laughs> The Super Bowls are stories of both success and failure. Each has its moments when some of the This is a moment of professional football, and each year the footprints are blown away, clearing a path for other teams with other stars to make their way to the peak. And each year the footprints are blown away clearing a path for other teams with other stars to make their way to the peak. After the leagues agreed to merge in the summer of 1966, one of the details to be worked the details, the site, and so on for the championship game to be played between the two leagues. And we never knew what to call the game. My children each had a, a ball called a super ball, and my daughter was always talking about that ball. It was a highly concentrated rubber ball that you could bounce on concrete, and it would literally bounce over a house, very much like a golf ball would. And she was always talking about that Super Bowl, and I think it was one of those spontaneous things. I just said, you know, the last game, the final game, the Super Bowl. The last game, the final game, the Super Bowl. On January 15th, 1967, the Kansas City Chiefs and Green Bay Packers met in the very first AFL-NFL championship game. Everybody in the Chiefs organization felt an awareness that we were representing the six-year history of the American Football League. We weren't just representing Kansas City or the Chiefs. We were representing the whole AFL. And I'm sure on the other side, the Packers felt the same way, too, for the NFL. But that first game was the team from the pure AFL against the pure NFL. This was to be the only championship ever televised by two networks. Maybe that's why so many of Hollywood's most famous faces were out to see and be seen. Perhaps it's also why this was the only Super Bowl that did not sell out. Big Ten saw the underdog Chiefs score twice in the first half to stay close to the favored Packers. 14 score twice in the first half to stay close to the favored Packers. 14-10. But Kansas City Rams worried about pregame statements made by Chiefs cornerback Fred Williamson. If we had any psychological advantage going against the Packers in Super Bowl I, uh, we couldn't do any talking. We have to be quiet. And here's Fred expounding on what he was and was going to do to the Packers, and how he was going to level them. Man known as the Packers, we can come down and meet receiver Carol Dale and Boyd Dollar. Stram quietly comes over to me and says, that kind of attitude we can't have here. You can't be that kind of braggadocio guy that uh, you're going to... Uh, alert the Packers that we're here, and I'm thinking, uh, they know we're here. 
If I tell you that Boyd Dial is not going to catch a pass, it's because I believe it. If I tell you Carol Dell is going to be spending half the game on his behind, it's because I believe it. As a matter of fact, the first fake Boyd Dial gave me, uh, they carried him off the field after that. He, he caught one pass, a slanting over the middle, and I said, this is just what I'm looking for. The guy carried him off the field after that. He, he caught one pass, a slanting over the middle, and I said, this is just what I'm looking for. The guy 6'7", six, 6'8", six, coming across on a slant in on the hammer. And I hit him with everything that I had, and they took him off the field because the shoulder was no longer no normal. And now if they want to blame the loss of the game on me, they can blame it on this particular incident because of the fact that after that, Max McGee came in. And it takes him an hour and 25 minutes to run a 100-yard dash. He goes over on the other side of the field, and I look up, he's catching two slanting passes for two touchdowns. As damaging as the McGee scores were, it was Willie Wood's third quarter interception that devastated the Chiefs. And it is intercepted. After Wood brought the ball deep into Kansas City territory, the legendary Packer sweep took center stage. Kansas City 14, to Jim Taylor on a power sweep, cutting back at the 10, Taylor is in for the touchdown. A lot long, but the Packers still had some unfinished business left with the hammer. Well, I had set myself up because I was the Pied Piper. The Green Bay Packers are going to get the hammer. Donny Anderson came around, and his knee hit me right on the smack right here in the forehead, and I went down. And I was a little woozy. The hammer! The hammer! You know who got hurt? The hammer. The hammer! Let's go! Let me nail the hammer. Hey, slap! The hammer got it! Really? I'm the clown of the football field now, because I'm, I'm out. They got the hammer. They said, come on, get up. And I refused to get up. I'm embarrassed. They came, and they dragged me off the field, and dumped me on the sidelines. When he dumped me, I jumped up, and I waved at my fans to let them know I was all right. The Hammer was conscious enough to read the final score. Packers 35, Chiefs 10. An important victory for the NFL and Green Bay coach Vince Lombardi. Vince would bring his Titans back the following year to Miami's Orange Bowl for their second straight AFL-NFL championship. This time, the opposition was the Oakland. The opposition was the Oakland Raiders, who simply could not stop this team of Green Bay legends. The Raiders did themselves no favors by committing a wide variety of flexibilities. Silver and Black have played some of the best postseason games in football history, but this was certainly not one of them. Green Bay bolted to a 16-7 second quarter lead, with the key play coming on a 62-yard touchdown pass from game MVP Bart Starr to a now very healthy Boyd Dowler. But as the Packers went to the locker room at halftime, something besides simply the game's outcome weighed heavily on their minds. We had all been pretty aware of the fact that Coach Lombardi was thinking very, very seriously about retirement. And uh, while many of us cuss him or call him names or a number of things, it's something like you might do with your family. You can call your, you might do with your family. You can call your brother something, but don't let anybody else call him the same thing. This is the same way with Mr. Lombardi. We can cuss him, but don't let anybody else holler at him. And we all felt that this was going to be his last game. And uh, I, I said to the fellows, I said, look, we got 30 more minutes this year. I said, let's give it to the old man. Let's play the last 30 for the old man. That's about all I said. The message was heard loud and clear. Number 26, cornerback Herb Adderley keyed a second-half onslaught that buried the Raiders 33-14, and gave my victory in the last game he ever coached for the Packers. The World Championship Award he earned now bears the name the Vince Lombardi Trophy in his memory. Super Bowl III provided the classic matchup of David and Goliath. The AFL underdog Jets versus the NFL senior underdog Colts. But you got to understand that the that the whole NFL thing was riding on us. The whole NFL thing was riding on us. That these upstarts actually were going to play against us, and we were 15 and one. The only game we lost to the just played Cleveland for the NFL title, and now we we're going to finish up as the greatest team in history. We never recognized the American Football League, never watched their games. I'd never seen Joe Namath throw a football until I, the warm-ups prior to that game. We didn't recognize him. That was just a semi-pro league that uh, if you couldn't make it in the NFL, that's where you went. Namath would be the central character of an incredible pre-game drama in Miami. Ironically, Joe's coach, Weeb Eubank, had gone to great lengths to avoid controversy. He wasn't entirely successful. Well, the thing that I thought happened in Super Bowl III, that Weeb handled it great. 
He took us down there three days early, uh, turned the players loose, no bed check. Then uh, we started our week preparation for the team. They brought the wives in, they room with their wives. Well, there's one thing that we at Eubank had drummed into our head. He says, whatever you do, don't open your mouth. Don't say anything. Eubank had drummed into our head. He says, whatever you do, don't open your mouth. Don't say anything that might incite these guys. Well, what does Namath do? He makes some remark that there were five quarterbacks in the AFL that were better than Earl Morrill. And, you know, we're all saying, Joe, we have to block these people. You don't. One fellow who took particular exception to Joe's criticism of Colt quarterback Morrill was Colt place kicker Lou Michaels. The scuffle at the bar between uh, Namath and uh, Michaels. Uh, Joe was saying how they were going to kick the uh, butts of the Colts, and uh, Lou Michaels said uh, not only were the Colts going to kick the uh, Jets' butts, but he would personally that night uh, do the same thing to Joe. And it ended up uh, Joe being a smarter guy uh, that he ended up buying around the drinks, and everybody ended up uh, having a good time that night. But just when matters finally appeared to quiet down, Namath dropped his ultimate bombshell. He was at a uh, banquet and where they honored him, and and, uh, and during a question and answer uh, uh, session, where they asked him, uh, uh, "What do you think uh, about the game? Who's going to win?" He said, "Well, we'll win, and I guarantee it." Well, I could have shot him because he upset everything that I had done. But as it turned out, I think it really helped us because we all felt that way, but none of us wanted to come out and say it. Well, Joe was really the leader of that team, and he just says, hey, I'll get up and say it, and he got up and blurted it out. And when Joe came out and said he guaranteed that the Jets were going to win, our people got angry, and I thought, boy, this is just what we need. We were practicing in Boca Raton, and I mean, we had quality football practices for that game. And Shula had to call off the dogs. We were beating each other to death. We were favored by 19 points in that game. Uh, it was not even supposed to be a game. And we went in there knowing that these guys couldn't beat us. On their best day and our worst, they couldn't beat us. Well, it turned out on our worst day and their best, they could beat us. It certainly was the worst day ever for NFL Player of the Year, Earl Morrill. All season, Morrill had quarterbacked the Colts brilliantly. But January 12th, 1969 was to be his day of infamy. The Jets intercepted Morrill three times at the goal line. The most humiliating heist coming just before halftime. On a flea flicker play, Earl Morrill was the only man in the stadium who did not see a wide open Jimmy Orr. When Earl threw to a different receiver, it was the Jets' Dick Hudson who ended up with the ball. Not only wasn't Baltimore crushing New York, they were losing at halftime 7-0. The Jets built a 16-7 lead that could not be overcome, even by future Hall of Fame quarterback Johnny Unitas. The day instead belonged to the swaggering and outspoken Joe Namath. Namath had guaranteed victory earlier that week. Against the Colts, he backed up his flamboyant boasts. Namath on a handoff to Matt Snell. Snell at the five. Snell at the three. Snell touchdown. This block has run up, and the ball game is over. There's the gun, and the Jets are champions of the football world. If Namath was the star of the Super Bowl three upset, the central character in Super Bowl IV between the Vikings and Chiefs was Kansas City coach Hank Stram. Come on, Lenny! Pump it in there, baby! Just keep matriculating the ball down the field, boys! Let's go there, baby! Push it all down! Stram prodded, encouraged, cajoled, and fired up the underdog Chiefs all game. Of course, having pro football's number one defense at his disposal didn't hurt matters either. The Viking offense had run roughshod through the NFL, yet the Chiefs held them to a paltry seven points. Although the play of the defense warmed Stram's heart, an occasional referee judgment elicited a cool rejoinder. Boy, that's a bad call. Mr. Official, let me ask you something. How can six of you miss a play like that, huh? All six of you. The ball jumped out of there as soon as we made contact. And nobody... I thought you were talking about you being on the field. No. What? Hey, hey, we, go, we don't give them anything, man. We keep scoring that pressure on, putting the coal in the fire. Kick it up high, man. Let's go. Come on. No frozen rope. Get it up in the air so we can cover this thing, all right? Let's go. Three field goals gave Kansas City a 9-0 lead. 
And then, a Minnesota mistake handed the Chiefs a golden opportunity. We got the ball, boys. Stram didn't hesitate, calling for his favorite goal line play. 65 toss power trap. Look for 65 toss power trap. What does it look like? Hey, look for our 65 toss power trap. Let's see what it looks like. Gloucester, tell him 65 toss power trap. Get in there for 65 toss power trap. Let's block. Let's Come on, Lenny, let's, let's get seven ball. points. Come on, let's go. 65 toss power trap. That might pop wide open, Rats. Was that there, boys? The old manager? You saw it again on television. Coach pumped it in there, boys. Late in the game, the Chiefs drove the final nail in the Vikings' coffin. Quick count. Dawson throws sideline pattern. Taylor. The Chiefs won 23-7, ending the AFL-NFL competition at a 2-2 tie. The next season brought a merger between the two leagues, along with the most blunder-filled Super Bowl game ever played. In Super Bowl V, the Baltimore Colts and Dallas Cowboys hooked up in what could best be described as a comedy of errors. Nothing went according to plan. Even when the Colts dusted off a trick play and worked it to perfection, that too turned into an exploding cigar. Despite the endless supply of pratfalls, Dallas took a 6-0 lead, and the Colts would have to rally behind the leadership of legendary quarterback Johnny Unitas, who completed what was then the longest and strangest pass in Super Bowl history. Fires out left side, incomplete. Take it! It was just being in the right place at the right time. Uh, it was designed to go to Eddie Hinton. Um, I was clearing out the area. When I turned and looked back, the ball was just coming to me, and I caught it and ran for a touchdown. It wasn't designed. I didn't expect it. But it's just like that inborn reflex. It's the time you catch it, go, to, go for the end zone, you know. And uh, it gave us six points, which we badly needed at that time. Late in the game, with the score tied at 13, the Cowboys committed their final and most fatal faux pas. The Colts' Mike Curtis intercepted to set up the most exciting finish the Super Bowl has ever seen. Nine seconds showing on the clock. The Cowboys and the Colts all tied up at 13 to 13. There is the snap. The kick is up and is long enough. It is. The victory wiped out the Colts' bitter memories of Super Bowl III and made them world champions. In Sunsplash, New Orleans, Super Bowl VI welcomed a surprise visitor, the Miami Dolphins. In their first four years, this expansion team sought only respectability. Now, they were one win away from a world championship. While the Dolphins anticipated a bright future, the Dallas Cowboys were haunted by a history of losing the big games. They were always next year's champions. In Super Bowl V, they came up five seconds short. They were determined not to be denied again. The magical hands of Hall of Fame receiver Lance Allworth gave the Cowboys a 10-0 lead, while Miami continued to let scoring opportunity slip away. Larry Zonka fumbled for the first time in 238 carries, and Miami became the only team in Super Bowl history 
not to score a touchdown. People that had those white handkerchiefs waiting before we came out. You, you can't I think they're going to use it to dry their eyes now. Look at them. Dry your eyes and weep. <laughs> We're number one. Hey, let's get better now. We'll improve out here in the next couple series. Let's go. And Greasy back to throw again. Somebody fell down. It's a pass intercepted by Allen. The Cowboys rushed for a Super Bowl record 252 yards, and their defense limited the Dolphins to a low of 185 total yards. What do you think, Coach? Very nice. Congratulations. Really happy. Hurry up, Mike! We're finally number one, all right! After 13 years as head coach in Dallas, Tom Landry reached the pinnacle of pro football as his Cowboys demolished the Dolphins 24-3. After that terrible defeat at the hands of the, of the Cowboys in the Super Bowl, that was the turning point in the Miami Dolphins from just a good football team to a championship team. And the following July in training camp, Coach Shula said our objective is not to look back at what happened at the Super Bowl, but to now go forward and strive for perfection. And he said that boils down to taking a game at a time and winning every game. I don't know how many other people in that locker room or in that meeting room that day remember him saying that, but that was a forecast of what was he was actually predicting the future because we went undefeated that season. When the Dolphins reached the Super Bowl, they knew full well that 16 straight wins meant nothing without victory in the 17th. And it was a freak play that put Miami's streak in jeopardy. The kick is blocked, rolling loose on the field. It is picked up by Garrow. He tries to throw a pass, deflected in the air, grabbed by Bass. 40, 35, 30. He's going to score. 10. Gary, a premium situation. I think Gary always pictured himself as uh, uh, Roman Gabriel in uh, 6'6 and flowing hair, <laughs> standing amidst the masses and throwing the winning touchdown. Unfortunately, Gary's, uh, uh, <laughs> Gary's dream didn't come true quite that way. In football, there's many tests, but I think Gary, your premium, passed the supreme test because had I been he at that moment, I would not have gone to the Dolphins' sideline. I've never seen Coach Shula look like that before or since. Garo at that point was not a naturalized citizen. He was still waiting for his papers. And I think he had used Shula as a reference. <laughs> to be honest with you, if I would have been Gary your premium after that play, I would have run out at the end of the Coliseum and borrowed someone's car and drove to the coast and taken a boat back to Cyprus. <laughs> Fortunately, we won it, and I don't know of anyone that was happier in that locker room than Gary Premium. He must have come around and shook hands uh, seven or eight times. <laughs> the world champions bubble refused to burst the following year when they took on the Minnesota Vikings in Super Bowl VIII. Winners of 31 of their last 33 games, the Dolphins pounded the opposition with the relentless running of Larry Zonka who rushed for a then Super Bowl record 145 yards and two touchdowns. Breezy turning around to check his running backs. Looks as though he's almost talking to Zanka. and go from the five. It's Zonka straight up the middle, and he's got the touchdown. Larry Zonka carries it in from five yards out. His second touchdown of the afternoon. Zonka was named most valuable player, and the Dolphins were proclaimed a dynasty. The Minnesota Vikings were the losingest team in Super Bowl history. And in 1975, they looked to turn the tide against the Pittsburgh Steelers. But if Super Bowl VIII seemed like a horror film starring Larry Zonka, its sequel, Super Bowl IX, featuring Franco Harris, was even worse for the Vikings. Number 32 turned Minnesota's purple people eaters red-faced. 
Behind playbook perfect blocking, Harris broke Zonka's record by amassing 158 yards rushing. Forty-two years of losing and frustration ended with a 16-6 Pittsburgh win. And no one was more fulfilled than the man they call the Chief, Steelers owner Art Rooney. The popular patriarch was a lovable loser no longer. Rooney and the Steelers sought to continue their winning ways against the Dallas Cowboys in what may have been the most exciting Super Bowl ever, Super Bowl X. From the beginning, the Cowboys made it look easy when Roger Staubach connected with Drew Pearson for a 29-yard score. It was the only touchdown the Steelers permitted in the first quarter of any game all year. But the Steelers recovered when Terry Bradshaw rolled right and found tight end Randy Grossman in the end zone. It appeared the Cowboys were loading their guns for a shootout. The Steelers accepted the challenge. They unleashed their most devastating weapon, a graceful gazelle named Lynn Swan. Swan's levitating leap is considered one of the greatest catches in football history. Then, he literally rose to the occasion to haul in the game's winning score. Now he fires for the bomb, and Lynn Swan going for it. Swan pulls it in for a touchdown! Lynn Swan beat his man on a bomb! Swan set a Super Bowl record with 161 yards on four receptions and captured MVP honors. For the Cinderella Cowboys, their storybook season came up four points short, 21-17. For the Steelers, Super Bowl X was another chapter to be carved into football history as they established themselves as one of the greatest teams of all time. From the Rose Bowl Stadium in Pasadena, California, it is Super Bowl XI. This is Bill King with a welcome. Everything in the United States, everything really in a sports sense in the world, is zeroed in, focused today, here in the canyon at Arroyo Seco. This 11th Super Bowl will be viewed in 41 nations around the world. Desde el Tazón de las Rosas en Pasadena, California, los Raiders de Oakland y Vikingos de Minnesota se enfrentan en el Super Tazón número 11. The Raiders of Oakland, champion de la Conférence Américaine, and the Vikings de Minnesota, champion de la Conférence Nationale. We are about to bring to you the 11th Super Sunday Super Bowl. Neither the Vikings nor the Raiders had ever won a Super Bowl. But from the start, it appeared Oakland, the NFL's most consistent winner for over a decade, would finally claim its first title. Raider quarterback Ken Stabler had no difficulty avoiding the jaws of the Purple People Leader defense. And his touchdown pass to tight end Dave Casper helped Oakland build a 16-0 first-half lead. Then, the vicious Raider defense choked the life out of the Minnesota offense. And in the final quarter, the Raiders' secondary turned the Vikings' comeback dream into a hopeless quest. Francis back to pass, throw the sideline, or picked off! It's going to be a touchdown! Willie Brown! 45, 40, 35, 30, 25, 20! Old man Willie! He's going all the way! Willie Brown's 75-yard interception return for a touchdown iced the Raiders' 32-14 win and dealt Minnesota an agonizing fourth Super Bowl loss. The Raiders had never won a world championship. That was their albatross. But even that flew away with their convincing victory in Super Bowl XI. Though Super Bowl XII took place in the New Orleans Superdome, 
the stadium was filled with a fever called Broncomania. But while this game between Denver and Dallas would be fiercely fought, it would also be frighteningly flawed. The game set a Super Bowl record for turnovers, but the Cowboys shook off their mistakes and responded in spectacular fashion. by Johnson and Golden Richards gave Dallas a 27-10 win, evening its Super Bowl record at 2-2. Two two. Super Bowl 12 lacked structure and style, but the intensity displayed by the Cowboys earned them a world championship. The Cowboys returned to the title game the following year, but this time their opponent was a Super Bowl veteran. The Pittsburgh Steelers were a big play team, and in the first quarter, they lived up to their billing. John Stallworth's touchdown gave the Steelers a 7-0 lead, but the Cowboys quickly proved that they could match big plays with anyone. Tony Hill, number 80, tied the score. Then, the doomsday defense made the Steelers' Superman-like offense resemble a bumbling Clark Kent. Linebacker Mike Hegman stole the ball from Bradshaw, and his touchdown return was a bitter pill for the Steelers to swallow. But it was just the tonic they needed. When Pittsburgh regained the ball, John Stallworth turned a routine sideline pass into a marathon 75-yard touchdown run that tied the game at 14. The Steelers were a mature, physically powerful team with a special confidence. When a title was on the line, they reached for the sky. Rocky Blyer's touchdown gave the Steelers a 21-14 halftime lead. But late in the third quarter, Tom Landry's Cowboys were on the verge of tying the game once again. It's third down and three, Dallas at the Pittsburgh 10. Roger back to throw, has a man open in the end zone, caught, touchdown, drop, dropped in the end zone, Jackie Smith all by himself. Oh, bless his heart, he's got to be the sickest man in America. Oh, Jackie was... Dallas's misfortune turned into a crucial scoring swing for Pittsburgh. The Steelers answered with a Franco Harris touchdown run, then with a Terry Bradshaw to Lynn Swan six-point masterpiece. Pittsburgh's 35-31 win put tears in the eyes of Texas. And in a contest that was everything a championship game is supposed to be, the Steelers earned their third Super Bowl crown. The Steelers and the Rams arrived at the Super Bowl from opposite directions. Pittsburgh was the defending champion, while Los Angeles had the worst record of any team to ever play in a Super Bowl. However, with nothing to lose and everything to gain, the Rams played with abandon and earned a three-point halftime lead. The kick has the distance. It is good. And the Rams are in front 13 to 10. Trailing at the half, Stoic Steeler coach Chuck Noll was surprisingly casual. He must have known. It was just a matter of time before his team took control. And he was right. He looks downfield, has time, cranks it, going long for Swan! He's got it! Swan! The Steelers were still the same tough Steelers, but they soon discovered that their opponent was eager to wear the look of a Super Bowl champion. Call goes to McCutcheon, option pass, he throws downfield, leaping drop, touchdown, Rod Smith! Trailing in the final quarter, 
the Steelers made their move to rid themselves of the upstart Rams. He pulls it in at the 30, the 20, the 10, the 5, and it's a touchdown for Pittsburgh. By day, the Rams' sparkling spirit had kept the game close. But by night, it faded into black reality. That first long pass to Stallworth had given the Steelers the lead. This one pointed the way to a 31-19 victory. He's got it at the 25 and down at the 22. And now the Rams really with their backs to the wall. Time running out. Harris flashes up the left side for a touchdown. Franco Harris. Super Bowl 14 took its shape from the team that lost, just as much as the team that won. Los Angeles earned a dignity in defeat that few teams achieve in victory. The Rams won respect, but the Pittsburgh Steelers won another world championship and became the first team to win four Super Bowls. Super Sunday, what a day, I can't believe it. It's like a dream come true. It's unbelievable. Yes, and we're gonna win. We are gonna win, no question. Is upon us. Super Bowl 15 featured a striking contrast in opponents. The freewheeling, villainous Raiders versus the hard-working, disciplined Eagles. All right, double, double, base pass, 46, 47, check with me. Time to throw. He's got his bag. Here's one. Here's one. Oh, Ronnie. No. Throw it right to him. Back to pass, now goes Jaworski. Looking, being chased out of the pocket of the right. He's got running room, directing play, going deep. A bomb to the end zone. Touchdown called back. Is that on Harold, Dick? Harold Carmichael had jumped off sides, and the penalty left the Eagles in a state of shock. They never recovered. Here comes the rush. Steps up. Can't find anybody yet. Tits off running to the left. Rolls on the move. And it's caught by King at the 40. Quarterback Jim Plunkett, the game's most valuable player, threw three touchdown passes. His third to Cliff Branch earned Oakland a win and their second Super Bowl title. Silver and black football is king of the hill in the National Football League. Morning for News Radio 95. In the city right now, the relative humidity is 66%. Southwesterly winds at 21, giving us a wind chill factor of 25 degrees below zero. A Super Bowl has here. Both team has here. High winds and very cold temperatures are the main factor to contend with. The wind chill index 25 to 35 below zero on strong winds. In one respect, Detroit Silver Dome was an appropriate site for the Bengals and 49ers to face off in Super Bowl 16. Both teams had come in from the cold to feel the warm glow of success after years of bitter disappointment. Cincinnati's veteran quarterback Ken Anderson, however, met with disappointment inside the dome early on. At the 49er eight-yard line, Eric Wright stripped Chris Collinsworth of the ball to snuff out a Bengal drive. San Francisco quickly marched 92 yards for a 14 to nothing lead. Here's Montana throwing toward the end zone, caught on the run by Cooper. He's got it. He's in the end zone. A 49er touchdown. A field goal made it 17 to nothing. And like a smoldering fire, the Bengals could be smothered by another mistake or fanned to life by a touchdown. Anderson's five-yard scramble put the Bengals on the board and fired up a defense that held San Francisco's innovative attack to a total of four yards in the third quarter. Trailing 20 to 7, a 49 yard bomb from Anderson to Collinsworth put the Bengals in a position to score their second touchdown. 
three straight times from inside the five-yard line. The Bengals were turned away. And on fourth down, they called on short yardage specialist Pete Johnson. On fourth down, has the ball, hands it off. He's hit at the goal line. I don't believe he got in. I don't believe he's in there. The 49ers have held and listen to the Niners crowd across the way. The 49ers have won it. Bill Walsh and his staff and a team that's confounded pro football observers throughout the year. Beating the AFC champion Cincinnati Bengals in the Super Bowl. Notre Dame's Joe Montana earned MVP honors, and a year later, another Irish alumnus, Joe Theismann, hoped to duplicate that feat. We busted our We worked harder than anybody to get here. Nobody can beat us in a team, and it's worth 70,000 and a big ring. However, in the early going, center stage belonged to Miami's David Woodley. Makes the pass, coming to the near side. He's got Cephalo wide open. Big gainer. He's got a man beat to the 40, to the 30. He could be gone. It's a horse race. It's a Miami touchdown. 76-yard touchdown pass thrown by David Woodley, and they did something weird there that caught the defense with their pants down. 24-year-old Woodley was the youngest quarterback to start in a Super Bowl. But ultimately... A battle toughened old fullback named John Riggins would determine the game's outcome. Washington's front line had earned the nickname the Hogs, while Riggins was branded the Diesel. Bad John carried the skins to an early field goal, then carried them once more towards a game-tying touchdown from Joe Theismann to Alvin Garrett. Lob into the end zone. Garrett's there. Touchdown, Washington Redskins. He got it. Redskins are going to tie this football game. Well, the killer bees, the killer bees have been stung. They have. Miami's killer bees had been stung. But seconds later, Washington was burned by Dolphin return man, Fulton Walker. Walker. He's got it at the 2, out to the 5, to the 10, comes to the near side, to the 20. He's out to the 25, turns it back. He's gone. 50-yard line, 40-yard line. He's gone. It's a touchdown. A 98-yard kickoff return for a touchdown for the Miami Dolphins. And as soon as the Redskins tie up, the Dolphins come back on top. Late in the third period. Washington added a field goal, and Joe Theismann turned in a terrific heads-up play by batting a tipped pass away from the arms of Kim Bokemper, denying him a sure touchdown. Theismann had saved the game. Now, Riggins and the Hogs would win it. For the second straight season, Washington earned the right to compete for the Lombardi Trophy, but ran smack into the Los Angeles Raiders. From the outset, the skins were outmatched, outmuscled, and outplayed. He's back. High snap. He goes up. Block. It's going to be blocked into the end zone. The Raiders on a chase. It'll be recovered in the end zone. It'll be After Derek Jensen scored, reserve linebacker Jack Squirek faced off against Joe Theismann. With 12 seconds left in the half, Squirek made history. It's off to the left, he fires it off, they're intercepted! Jack Squirek, touchdown Raiders! I don't believe it! Holy Toledo! It was a silver and black Sunday from start to finish as Marcus Allen dazzled the nation and earned the title most valuable player. Block it giving to Allen, sending him wide left, he has to reverse his field, but he, and he gets away for a moment. The 
Let's keep dominating this team. Let's keep dominating. Keep dominating. Leave no doubt. That's right. Let's just abuse them. Let's abuse them. For the Redskins, it was a defeat the dimensions of which no honor could be salvaged, as the Raiders routed them 38 to 9. A commitment to excellence is the motto of the Raiders. And once again, they fulfilled that commitment with their third world championship. Coach Tom Flores and the Raiders did not reach Super Bowl 19. Instead, it was Don Shula and his explosive Dolphins who would meet wise Bill Walsh and his potent 49ers in a showcase for rifle arm Dan Marino and crafty Joe Montana. Montana and halfback Carl Monroe combined for a quick score, but Marino and Dan Johnson answered for Miami. Working without a huddle, Marino fired Miami to a 10-7 lead. But in a record-setting scoring spree in the second quarter, the 49ers unleashed their versatile and varied attack in a hurricane of 21 unanswered points. Defense just cannot cope with the 49ers now. While Marino and the Dolphins sputtered, Montana and his Niners were running on all cylinders, as Miami's young linebackers simply couldn't cope with Bill Walsh's masterfully conceived game plan. We came to see an offense and the wrong one showed up. Dan Marino's year turned into Joe Montana's day as Walsh's 49ers were world champions for the second time, 38-16. On January 26th, millions across the globe hung over their TV sets and thousands of hungover purposes for Super Bowl XX. The surprising New England Patriots and the mighty, and the mighty Chicago Bears squared off to determine who indeed was the NFL's best. Hey, 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 the tone right now you belong here you're the best let's do it Go. Go. free after the first period and they're punishing 46 defense a unit that had shut out both the giants and rams in the playoffs began to dominate the defensive scheme and for the patriots this day the 46 simply blew them away The swarming monsters of the Midway took it upon themselves to score one of their own as number 48, Reggie Phillips, took a deflected pass in from 28 yards out. Touchdown to the third quarter, a Super Bowl record. With the last coming, courtesy of the man everyone came to see, his immenseness, the refrigerator. William Perry's one-yard rumble gave Chicago an almost embarrassing advantage. It was only appropriate that the Bear defense logged the final points in Super Bowl 20. And a safety, courtesy of the Super Bowl, and Margin, a complete total effort by the world champion Bears. When 1985 began, the Bears were on a mission, and in January of 1986, that mission was accomplished. George Hallis smiled down from heaven, ear to ear. won their first one. Boy, this feels good. Two sad notes, however, echoed after the year. won their first Boy, this feels good. Two sad notes, however, echoed after their impressive win. Walter Payton did not score a touchdown in the game. And soon after, if it's a crime, leave to get coaching in Philadelphia. Nevertheless, Mike Ditka's Chicago Bears were indeed kings for a day. Hey, you wanted it, you worked for it, you earned it, and then you went on and took it. And God bless you, it's the greatest thing I've ever seen. I'm happy for everyone here, I love everyone here.
The Denver Broncos came to Super Bowl XXI hoping they would win. The New York Giants came knowing they would. The Giants had bullied and beaten the Bulls all year. After dominating the regular season and playoffs, nothing would stop Bill Parcells' team on Super Sunday. Morris, he fakes the handoff. Sam's trying to throw does. Touchdown, big boy! For Sunday. Morris, he fakes the handoff. Sam's trying to throw does. Touchdown, big boy! Very good, Jimmy! New York took an early 7-3 lead. But easy victory disappeared on the vapor trails made by John Elway's right arm. Elway's one-man show played center stage in the giant end zone. Motion to the right by Jackson. Elway's the But moments later, Elway found himself in the wrong end zone. He's in the end zone. He got him. The safety was worth more than two points, as it marked Denver's demise and the beginning of giant superiority. In the first half, the Giants were characters in the story. In the second, they authored the script for Super Bowl XXI. Mark Bavaro's touchdown began an onslaught of Giant points. McConkey comes in motion to the right-hand side. Pitch, Morris returns around. McConkey comes in motion to the right-hand side. Pitch, Morris returns around back to Sims on the flea flicker. Sims is looking way downfield. He's got a receiver. Complete. Down to the 10. In a dazzling performance that made history, game MVP Phil Simms picked Denver apart. The Giants scored 30 second half points to set a score. The start of the victory celebration and the coronation of the New York Giants as champion. The Tough Guy Giants, Blue Collar Champions. The Tough Guy Giants, Blue Collar Champions. Boys at heart, but giants among men. And the NFL's 21st Super Bowl Champions. Time the great John Elway touched the ball. He set a record by triggering the quickest touch in seven nothing. In Denver's center, Elway set another one at pass in the Super Bowl. After the first quarter, Elway and the other one in Washington took a good step work upfield. If you just get a bite on him, try to get through, okay? What you don't want to do is get caught to try to bring him with you. You'll be playing with a hand, all right? The second quarter, to be specific. 15 minutes of madness for Denver, of might for Washington. A blur to the millions who watched. First and 10 at the 20-yard line. Eye formation. Play action fake. Williams going up top. Got Sanders on the fly. And Fields, he's gone. Unless they can catch him. The 30, the 20, the 15, the 10. Millions who watched. First and 10 at the 20-yard line. Eye formation. Play action fake. Williams going up top. Got Sanders on the fly. And Fields, he's gone. Here he comes. 
comes home. Take down everybody. He's got Sanders in the clear. It's down. Holy cow. It's 34. Before the game, Doug Williams was asked how it felt to be the Super Bowl's first black quarterback. A player by firing four touchdown passes in the second quarter alone. Yards set yet another record. Be the Super Bowl's first black quarterback. A player by firing four touchdown passes in the second quarter alone. Yards set yet another record. The Redskins scored five straight unanswered touchdowns in the most explosive quarter in Super Bowl history. At the heart of that attack was a previously anonymous running back named Timmy Smith, who ripped through gaping holes for 100 yards. The Washington Redskins became Super Bowl champions well before Chubby Checker's halftime medley. Denver's gimmicks, gadgets, the Duke and the three amigos were simply no match for Washington's opponent against the ropes and with mighty combinations spent the second half pounding John Elway. The opponent against the ropes and with mighty combinations spent the second half pounding John Elway. The only bit of drama remaining was Timmy Smith's pursuit of Marcus Allen's Super Bowl rushing mark. Smith's 204 yards set a new standard, and his second score mercifully ended Super Bowl XXII. Snap, here comes Timmy Smith, up the middle, touchdown! For the second time in a decade, Washington claimed the Vince Lombardi Trophy. The Redskins had blazed their warpath. And it had taken them down. Bullock, <laughs> <laughs>